Well, good evening. It is an honor and it is a privilege to be here at this event. I was going to be on vacation with my family. Providentially, the vacation was bumped and we got to be here. So thank you so very much uh, for having me tonight. I have the privilege of what I consider sharing the best news on the planet with you. So glad that you're here. What I'd like to do is just pray, share a few verses from Scripture, share a short devotion with you, and trust that the Lord is going to use it in your lives tonight. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, I thank you for this wonderful crowd that is gathered here tonight and pray that you would do a work that only you can do, that you would move and that you would touch every single heart in this room, that you would speak clearly from your word, Lord, that we would hear you and that we would be willing to put into practice everything that you show us. And for your great name, we give you all the glory, the name of Jesus, amen, amen. A number of years ago, I graduated from the University of Illinois having played football there. And uh, for the businesses that I was in, we had an annual meeting. And at the annual meeting, the way that they kicked off the annual meeting was running a 5K race. And I remember all my friends said, hey, you got to run this thing. And I was all excited to do it. The only problem is I didn't know what the letter K actually stood for. So I got all dressed up. They told me to wear shorts and a t-shirt, put on some tennis shoes and come. And I went there. And when I got there, it was amazing. I'd never seen anything like it. There were thousands of runners that were lined up. I'd never run further than about 100 yards in my life. And all these people were there. And not only were they getting ready to run, they were running to get ready to run. I mean, skinny little people running to get ready to run. And it was so exciting because I'd never seen anything like it. Music was pumping. And a couple of my friends that were in the front, they were like, hey, Jeff, come on up here. And I remember thinking, okay, and I, I walked up. I'm like, well, what are we doing up here? They said, you're not going to win this thing anyway. Just get a good start up here with us. And I said, well, how do you run the thing? They said, really, all you do is run as hard as you can for 3.1 miles. And when you're done, you're done. Now, I don't know about you, but I'd never run a 5K race before. And I remember standing there at the starting line, and the music was pumping, and they got the countdown. It was like at five minutes, and then three, and then two, and then one. When they started the 10-second countdown, everybody was chanting, 10, 9, 8, so forth. And as it was happening, the, the athlete in me kind of got excited. And I thought, I'm not going to win this race, but I may as well take off like I am. And on the count of one, when they blew the gun, I took off in a dead sprint. I mean, I sprinted as fast as I could. I could hear my friends laughing as I took off. And I remember when I got about two blocks down, I looked back behind me and I saw like 5,000 heads of people bouncing like this. And one thought went through my head, I'm winning the race. <laughs> and I was for about another block. And never have I seen more people pass me. I mean, at one point in time, I thought my name was on your left because that's what I kept hearing people say. And when I got to the first water station, I gulped water. I was asking how much further. They said two more miles. I was finished. I was done. All I could think about was one thing. I just wanted to quit. But I kept on running. I got to the second one water station to add insult to injury. I remember this little kid, never seen him before, never seen him since, came by and patted me on my backside, said, come on, old man, you know you can do this, and took off. <laughs> and I remember thinking, Lord, if you just let me catch that little kid. I kept going, and all I wanted to do was quit. I don't know if you've ever had a season like that in your life, because all these thoughts were going through my head on the streets of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where I was saying, nobody cares about this stupid race anyway. It doesn't really matter. Whether I finish or not isn't important. I'm not going to set any records, and all I wanted to do was quit. You ever wanted to quit before? I mean, when you talk about a 5K race, it's really not that big of a deal, and had I not finished that day, nobody would have cared, except I would have known that I was a quitter. But I find that the longer that we live in life, the harder it is to not quit. Maybe, maybe you're in a marriage that's difficult and you want to quit. Maybe you have a, a child that is going wayward that you've been praying for and you, you want to quit. Or just take a look around our nation if you would. I mean, especially in the last two years. I'm 51 years old. I was talking to my dad on the phone the other day. I said, Dad, is it just because I've grown in my faith? Is it just because I'm 51 or is it because our world has just slid out of control in the last two years? He said, no, it's slid out of control in the last two years. It's unlike anything I've ever seen. And when we see the depravity of our world and we see the way the world's going and we have certain values that we have on the inside and we wonder if they're ever going to make a difference, oftentimes we feel like quitting. We think our little part doesn't make that big of a difference. But I have good news for you tonight. God wants you to know that the part that you play and the reason he put you on the planet makes a huge difference. You know, I think the greatest leader in the entire history of the world is Jesus Christ. I believe he's the Lord of the universe. I believe he created everything. 
And it was interesting, he told a parable in Luke chapter 18 to a group of people, and he said this. Now, he was telling them a parable. A parable is just a story to come alongside to highlight a point, to show them that at all times they ought to pray and not lose heart. Two things Jesus said we needed to do when we feel like quitting. One, pray. Two, persevere. One, pray. One, never give up. One, pray. One, see it all the way through the finish. These are two things I find that we don't do very good as a culture, and we certainly don't do very well in the church. When it comes to prayer, most of us consider prayer just an afterthought. Once we've done everything that we think we need to do, maybe we throw a little prayer on there to act spiritual. Maybe at the dinner table we might offer up a little prayer. Come, Lord Jesus, be our guest and let these gifts to us be blessed. Maybe at night, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. And that's about it. And then we wonder why God isn't answering our prayer. See, God wants to be in communication with us. So Jesus said two things. One, you need to be in communication with God. And two, you need to persevere. Persevere means this. Every single one of you at some point in your life is going to feel like quitting what's most important for you to do. It means this. Don't give up. It means this. Stay in the fight. Perseverance means this. You will get knocked down. Perseverance means life is not going to be easy. Jesus said, in this world you will have tribulation. It's a biblical promise. Now, most of those biblical promises don't make the Bible promise books, I know, but the reality is you will have trouble in this world. So two things you need to do, pray and not give up. So Jesus tells this story, this parable. Listen to this story. He said in a certain city, he doesn't tell us which one. I think in our culture we could figure out where it is. There was a judge who did not fear God nor respect man. When you have people in political office that don't love God, they're not going to respect people either. That's just the way that it goes. That's why when Jesus was asked what the greatest commandment of all time is, he said what? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you do those two things, guess who you're not pointing at? Myself. Jesus said, love God, you'll love others. If you don't love God, you won't love others. You'll only love yourself and you'll only love your own agenda. So in this certain city, there's a judge. He cares nothing for God, which means he has no respect for people. And there's another character in this story, and it's a widow. Widows in those days didn't have any other income, didn't have any other source of support. And there was a widow in that city, and she kept coming to him saying, give me legal protection for my opponent. So here's what she needs. She's oppressed. She's not being treated fairly. Things aren't right for her, and she needs someone to help her, but the one who can help her doesn't love God and doesn't care about her. So she's got a problem. There's a problem in our culture right now with so many people in political office that don't love God and don't care for people. And when you have people in government that don't love God and don't care for people, here's what happens. They only care about themselves and their own agenda, and it doesn't work well, and it doesn't help the people that they're trying to help. So what's she going to do? She's going to pray and she's going to persevere. Notice what happened. It says, for a while he was unwilling, that's the judge, but afterward he said to himself, even though I do not fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow bothers me, I will give her legal protection. Otherwise, by continually coming to me, she will wear me out. Hear what the judge said? I don't love God. I don't care about her, but you know what she is? She's persistent. She's not going to quit. She's going to stay after it. And because she's going to stay after it, even though I don't love God, and even though I don't care about her, I'm still going to do something because she's going to persevere. Here's what I find the problem is in our culture. So many of us that have conservative values and conservative beliefs and the right thinking on so many things are too quick to give up are too quick to throw in the towel, are too quick to stop praying, are too quick to say it's too late. Friends, it's not too late. It's always darkest before the dawn. I got good news. Our greatest days are ahead of us. Amen. And hear this story. When you have people in politics that don't care about God, then they make decisions that don't care about people. About two years ago, there was a a virus that came out. You may have heard about it. It affected about 0.3% of the population called COVID-19. And when it came out, there were several in our government, including our governor, that said this, the church of Jesus Christ is not essential. And here's what I thought. He's probably right. It's not only not essential, it's primary and foundational and the most important institution on the planet. So we were told this, 
We can't have more than 10 people in our church. We couldn't have more than 50 people in our church. But unfortunately for him, we read our Bible and Jesus says, do not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but do it all the more as you see the day approaching. Now the name of our church is called Brave Church. And I told our elders, either we open the doors and do what Jesus tells us or we change the name of our church. So we opened our doors. And we kept our doors open, and we'll always keep our doors open because we trust what Jesus says, not what any political leader says. He's our founder. We pray and we don't give up because people need to hear about the good news of Jesus Christ. Now notice what Jesus says about this story. It's really interesting as he ties it all up. He says, and the Lord says, hear what the unrighteous judge said. Now will not God bring about justice for his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he not delay over them? I tell you the truth that he will bring about justice for them quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? He says, listen, if this unrighteous judge is listening to someone righteous and because that righteous widow is bothering him, how much more will my heavenly Father, who is righteous, listen to the prayers of his people and those who are doing the right things? Will he not bring justice? God will bring justice. I mean, we live in a confused society, and part of the reason for that is because people that play my role, people that are pastors in the pulpit that are scared to tell people the truth for fear that people might leave their church. I mean, we have all these problems in our culture. We have people teaching evolution, like nobody knows how we got here. We were just kind of like oozing this kind of mass, and then all of a sudden from that which was chaos and that which was nothing, all of a sudden everything became something. It's nonsense. We have a gender problem in our culture, right? We have a problem with understanding race in our culture. All it takes is a read through Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 31. And if you believe the authority of God's word, here's what you'll believe. There, are one, there is one race, the human race. There are two genders, and God created everything in six days. And it's crystal clear. And all the things we decide as a culture, if people believed what God said, would be relatively easy to unpack. Where did all the color of skin come from and how come they're different? Well, based upon geography and genetics, you got different colors of skin and that's not what makes you different, right? What makes us the same is we have the same creator, the same one that knit us together in our mother's womb, the same one that says we're fearfully and wonderfully made, the same one that says that when life begins at conception, it should continue on until life ceases and that we're never to stop it. Those are all things that you can learn in Genesis chapter 1. But unfortunately for many people in my role, they're scared to tell people that because they'll say, well, I have a lot of scientists in my congregation. I have a lot of biologists in my congregation. I have a lot of these people. I don't know if they're going to believe it. I really don't care whether you believe it. I'm not here to convince you. I'm here to tell you that the word of God is authoritative and it's true. Amen. And here's what we need to be aware of because I've been listening to your conference and I realize I share most if not all of your political values and conservative ideals because most of them come right out of the word. But it's interesting because when Jesus talks about the fact that justice is going to come and that the Son of Man is going to bring it, you need to realize when Jesus taught his disciples to pray, he said, Lord, he said to pray this way, let your kingdom come and let your will be done, where? On the earth as it is in heaven. When Jesus was prophesied about in the book of Isaiah, it said, for unto us a child is born, for us a son is given, and what? The government shall be upon his shoulders. Friends, regardless of who gets elected and regardless of who's ruling and reigning, on this side of heaven, we will never experience the utopia that Jesus Christ is going to bring. And what is tragic, beyond tragic, would be to be in a group like this and to share all the right values without having a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm here to tell you this. Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. Jesus Christ became flesh and was born of a virgin. Jesus Christ died for you because you couldn't keep the commandments. You couldn't keep any of them to the full. Jesus Christ died in your place and was punished on a cross for you. So that when you meet him, you can't say, well, I know I'm getting to heaven because I've kept the Ten Commandments. The Bible says, no, the Lord will shut your mouth with the law. You haven't kept them. You've all lied or cheated, stolen at least once in your life, right? 
Here's what he says. It won't matter if you say, well, I was Republican. It won't matter if you say I was conservative. It won't matter if you said I did all these wonderful things. Here's all that will matter on Judgment Day. What did you do with Jesus Christ when you learned that he died for you? Were you willing to repent and give your heart to him? Friends, I share many of your values. I love them because they come right out of the word of God. But most importantly, what I'm here to tell you about tonight is that the Lord Jesus Christ loved you so much. He died on a cross for your sins and that you must repent, which means you turn from your sin, allow Jesus Christ to be the Lord of your life. And if he's the Lord of your life, I'm telling you, the government that is on the way is greater than any government because it won't be a democracy It'll be a monarchy, and Jesus Christ will be ruling and reigning on the entire planet. Amen? Amen. I just want to close by praying for you. And if you'd like to trust Jesus Christ as your own personal Lord and Savior, then here's how you can pray. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner, but I believe you died for my sins on the cross and rose from the dead. Right now I want to turn from my sin and trust you as my personal Lord and Savior. Come into my life and change me. Father in heaven, do a work here tonight that can only be attributed to you. Father, we praise you for this group of people and all you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you very much for having me tonight.